Ezekiel chapter 6. Very powerful, powerful chapter, as you will see in just a moment, as, as the Lord is ministering through the prophet, a man by the name of Ezekiel, here in chapter 6. Let's begin reading here in Ezekiel chapter 6 at verse 1. I'll read verses 1 through 7, and we'll get into our study. Ezekiel chapter 6, and, and basically, it's going to be based on uh, the last verse, the last words that are printed there, they shall know that I am the Lord. And you're going to see that here in chapter 6, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 7. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face toward the mountains of Israel and prophesy against them. And say, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God to the mountains, to the hills, to the ravines, and to the valleys. Indeed, I, even I, will bring a sword against you, and I will destroy your high places. Then your altars shall be desolate, your incense altars shall be broken. I will cast down your slain men before your idols, and I will lay the corpses of the children of Israel before their idols, and I will scatter your bones all around your altars. In all your dwelling places the cities shall be laid waste, and the high places shall be desolate so that your altars may be laid waste and made desolate, your idols may be broken and made to cease, your incense altars may be cut down, and your works may be abolished. The slain shall fall in your midst, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Now, as we know, God has called Ezekiel to prophesy to the nation concerning judgment that is to come. We know that there were contemporary prophets. We know that Daniel prophesied in a similar time. We know that Jeremiah also prophesied in a similar time and during the same basic time period. We know that through studying the book of Jeremiah, that Jeremiah had been left in Jerusalem. And so at that time, Jeremiah in Jerusalem has been warning the people. The false prophets had arisen, and the false prophets had been prophesying peace. But God had been stating otherwise. He had told the people through Jeremiah that they would be in captivity for 70 years. But the people would not listen. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 10 says, Thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed in Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. So God had said through Jeremiah that they would be in captivity for 70 years, yet the people would not listen because they didn't want to hear those kinds of messages. As is typical with human nature, they wanted to hear a different kind of message. They wanted an upbeat, optimistic, positive word. They loved to hear those kinds of things. That's why Isaiah in uh, 750 years before Christ had said concerning them in Isaiah 39, 9, and 10, rather 39 and 10, this is a rebellious people, lying children, children who will not hear the law of the Lord, who say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us right things. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Tell us the things that we want to hear. Don't say the things that are hard for us. We want to hear upbeat, optimistic, positive messages. And here you are bringing a downer message to us. We don't want to hear it. And if it, if it means that you have to lie just to make us feel good, then by all means, tell us a lie. Now, it wasn't just during that time. As a matter of fact, it's interesting that when the Apostle Paul, centuries later, inspired by the Holy Spirit, was speaking concerning the conditions of the church in the last days prior to the return of Christ, it's interesting how the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy in chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, said the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. They will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. What was true during the time of Isaiah is also true during the time of Paul, which is also true during our days, these last days. That people will say, don't say to us things that actually cut us to the heart. Don't say anything that's going to cause me to feel any kind of guilt or a sense of conviction. I don't want to hear those kinds of things. Tell me something that will make me feel good about myself. 
You see, Ezekiel was a prophet prophesying to a group of people who were taken in Nebuchadnezzar's second attack on Jerusalem. And while Jeremiah was prophesying back in Israel, Ezekiel was prophesying there in Babylon. And he was working in an agricultural area near uh, the river Kebar, which was a channel of the Euphrates. And, and, and during that time, most of the people were still in the land of Israel, and Jerusalem was still standing. And yet, Ezekiel has the difficult duty of preaching a message of devastating judgment to come. They didn't want to hear it. The people do not want to hear the message, and they're resisting it. The fact that judgment was going to come, though, was going to validate Ezekiel as one who was actually speaking for God. That's why it said there in verse 7, The slain shall fall in your midst. You shall know that I am the Lord. This is going to demonstrate that God is speaking through him. All the way back in chapter 2 at verse 5, when God began the ministry through Ezekiel, he had said, As for them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, they're a rebellious house yet they will know that a prophet has been among them. This is a man who is speaking the mind of God to the people of God, to those who at least should have been listening as those who had been chosen, and that's what's taking place there. And so notice here in chapter 6 how it begins. Notice in verse 1 how, how Ezekiel says, the word of the Lord came to me. Now that's an important phrase there. We need to remember that what he's simply saying here is that uh, this isn't the word of man. This is the word of the Lord. It's not a message that has been created by Ezekiel. This isn't something that he just got tired of the people and, and stood up and said, thus saith the Lord. It wasn't that way at all. This is something that God had said he needs to say. This is something that, that he, he had, to, had to speak in, in obedience. It didn't come as a result of his, his imagination. Now, now, Jeremiah spoke concerning the false prophets and how they prophesied according to their own imagination. As a matter of fact, he had to give a warning in Jeremiah 23, 16. Thus says the Lord of hosts, don't listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you. They make you worthless. They speak a vision of their own heart, not from the mouth of the Lord. God had been saying judgment is coming. He had spoken through Jeremiah. He speaks through Daniel. He speaks through Ezekiel. And he's saying judgment is coming. Now, now when we read this and you see that judgment is coming, uh, I want to make sure that that we understand the reason that God would bring judgment to the nation. Some would say, weren't they simply innocent people? And if they were innocent people just doing the best that they could, then that, make, that main, makes God a, a tyrant. That makes God simply an, an angry God. Why is God going to bring judgment? Well, it's happening to them because they turned their backs on the Lord. It's happening to them because they had become idolaters. It's happening to them because they had great privileges, and, and, and those who have great privileges also have great responsibilities. And these are people who were instructed and knew better and yet didn't act according to what they had learned. They, they hadn't acted according to what God's Word Said. And so he's saying, this is the word of the Lord speaking. And then in verse 2, he says, Son of man, set your face toward the mountains of Israel and prophesy against them. So when he says, set your face towards the mountains, this isn't a poetic expression. What this is speaking about is God judging the whole land. You can see in Israel that they have various mountains there. They have Mount Carmel and Mount Hermon and Mount Geboa, there are various mountains. But this is something that's speaking really about the fact that God is going to judge from the north to the south. And so he says, set your face toward the mountains of Israel and prophesy against them, verse 3, and say, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God to the mountains, to the hills, to the ravines, to the valleys. Indeed, I, even I, will bring a sword against you. I will destroy your high places, your altars shall be desolate, your incense altars shall be broken, and I will cast down your slain men before your idols. I will lay the corpses of the children of Israel before their idols. I will scatter your bones all around your altars. In all your dwelling places, the cities shall be laid waste, the high places shall be desolate, so that your altars may be laid waste and made desolate, your idols may be broken, made to cease, 
Your incense altars may be cut down. Your works may be abolished. The slain shall fall in your midst. You shall know that I am the Lord. Now, when he speaks concerning these mountains and all, he also begins to speak concerning the fact that he's judging the land and the mountains can represent the high places where idolatry was practiced. So this is important if you take notes. Why are they being judged? They are being judged because of idolatry. That's why God is bringing judgment against the nation of Israel. And I want to speak with you a little bit about that tonight. That's why I'm only taking you into chapter 6. Originally, I was going to take you into chapters 6 and 7, but like I said earlier, I got, I got caught up with chapter 6, and so we're going to stay in chapter 6 tonight. And I, I wanted to give you, and not a thorough teaching, but I wanted to give you uh, a little more information than, than I would have given you had I just moved on into chapter 7. So let's begin by saying this as it relates to the reason God is judging. God is judging them because of idolatry. From the very beginning, when you see how God works with the nation of Israel, from the very beginning when God calls them out to be his own chosen people and he begins to give them laws, you see in the book of Exodus in chapter 20, when God begins to give them laws that would govern them, he made it very clear that idolatry in the nation of Israel is strictly forbidden. You see that from the very beginning in Exodus chapter 20, verses 2 through 5. This is what he said. He said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that's in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. From the very beginning, God said, you are to worship me alone and you are to have no false god, you are to have no idols. In uh, the fifth book of the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 14, he says there, you shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are all around you. God had chosen the nation of Israel to be his own special people. God had a relationship with them. He established through a covenant. But in the history of Israel, from the beginning, idolatry plagues the nation and continues through its history. Now, God had commanded the children of Israel to root out idolatry in the land that he would give to them. In Deuteronomy 12, 2 and 3, he said, You shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations which you shall dispossess serve their gods, on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. You shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, burn their wooden images with fire. You shall cut down the carved images of their gods and destroy their names from that place. So God had said, listen, I'm giving you the land that has been inhabited by idol worshipers. As you go in, you're going to find altars. You're going to find various remnants of their religion. I don't want you to learn their ways. Therefore, destroy all of those things and cleanse the land. But instead of them obeying God, they disobeyed him, and they habitually entered into idolatry. When you look into 2 Kings in chapter 17, verse 10, it says, they set up for themselves sacred pillars and wooden images on every high hill and under every green tree. That was typical of the nation, and so God is bringing judgment against them for that. God had made it very clear that they were not to do that. In chapter 5, in verse 13, he had said, Thus shall my anger be spent. I will cause my fury to rest upon them, and I will be avenged, and they shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it, on my, uh, spoken it in my zeal when I have spent my fury upon them. I want this to be dealt with, and I do not want you to have idols, and, and as a result of that, I'm going to have to judge you with a righteous zeal. Now, this is something that I found interesting, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to give it as clearly as... as as I, as I would like, to be honest with you. Because I, I found something interesting today as I was studying. I found something interesting about idolatry and, and, and one of the effects of it, one of the, if you call it fruit, the fruit of idolatry. I found it interesting because when they entered into idolatry, they also entered into immorality. Idolatry and sexual immorality seem to go hand in hand. 
And, and you see a lot of Scripture that, that points that out. There's just something about worshiping creation that lends itself to an immoral lifestyle. You see that in the book of Romans. I want you to turn there with me for a moment. Romans chapter 1. I'm going to develop this with you. Romans chapter 1. I want to show you something there, and I'm going to develop this further than that. But there seems to be a connection between idolatry and immorality. In Romans chapter 1, verse 20 following to verse 28, When the Apostle Paul was writing in chapter 1 of the book of Romans, he was speaking concerning the Gentiles and mankind in general. And so in verse 20, he says, Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because Although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness, in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. It's interesting, did you see that? I pointed out that they rejected God, they embraced nature, began to become idolaters, created a God in human image or in animal likeness, and continued in a debased manner to the point of sexual immorality. You see that over and over and over again in Scripture. If you take notes in, in 1 Kings in chapter 14, verses 22 through 24, it says, Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they committed more than all that their fathers had done. They also built for themselves high places, sacred pillars, wooden images on every high hill and under every green tree. Now listen, there were also perverted persons in the land. They did according to the abominations of the nations which the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel." Now, when it speaks concerning the fact that they entered into idolatry, they also entered into sexual perversion. When it says there were also perverted persons, I wanted to know exactly what that meant. How come you chose to use the word perverted person? And so I looked it up in the original language, the Old Testament uh, being written in Hebrew, and, and so I looked it up. The word perverted there speaks of a sodomite. It speaks of homosexual sin. And what he's saying is that there was a connection between their worship of false gods and their sexual behavior. Now, that is found in the Old Testament, but it's also found in the New. We read the explanation in Romans chapter 1, verses 20 through 28. But you see Paul saying something else in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. In Colossians 3, verse 5, he says, "...put to death your members which are on the earth." fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. And he speaks once again of sexual sin and idolatry, and apparently sexual sin can be a form of idolatry because it goes to the worshiping of creation rather than the Creator. 
And that's what you do is you emphasize something other than God in your life. And for some, the passion of lust is basically an idol. Now, as you turn on back to Ezekiel, I want to develop this a bit further. Lust, unlawful lust, is tied in with a lack of love for children. It's tied in with unnatural desires. It's tied in with idolatry. The lack of love for God is manifested by a lack of genuine affection for other people. When you don't love the Lord, you are not going to love others. Again, that's the heart of the question that was asked of Jesus, what is the great command in the law? Remember that. We recently went through that. What is the great command in the law? You're to love the Lord your God with everything within you. You're to love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Everything is summed up in loving God and expressing your love of God towards people. How can you say, John would say, uh, you love God whom you have not seen and hate your brother whom you have seen? So all the, the Scripture says, it's very simple in this, is that, listen, if I love God and have a relationship with God, then I'm going to treat people properly. I'm going to treat my kids properly. I'm going to treat my, my girlfriend uh, properly. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to treat my, my wife properly. I'm, I'm going to be a person who doesn't take advantage of them. I'm not going to use them for my own pleasure. I'm going to love them more than I love myself. And I, if I love them more than I love myself, then I'm going to be expressing the love of God towards them because if I have a relationship with God, then I'm going to treat other people properly because if God is my all in all, if everything is really summed up in Him, then, then I'm going to demonstrate this love for God in the way that I treat others. But when I don't have a relationship with the true God, then it's going to be demonstrated in the way that I treat other people. And so for me, then if I don't have a relationship with the Lord, I can use the word love, but that's simply another word for the word lust. And I can say it's love all I want, but simply by saying something doesn't make that word actually defined properly as, as love. I can say love all I want, but just because I call it love does not make it love. It's kind of like when Abraham Lincoln asked a question one time to a group of people. He said to them, say that you have a dog, but you call the tail of that dog a leg. Let me ask you, how many legs does the dog have? And somebody responded, five. Because you called the tail a leg, and the way the average person thinks, well, if the tail's being called a leg, then that means there's five legs. And he said, just because you call the tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. Very simple, but very true. And just because I call lust love doesn't make it love. Just because I say that I love God doesn't mean that I actually do. I'm taking a word and using it for God, but it's the same word I use for my car. It's the same word I use for a boat. It's the same word I use for my dog. It's the same word that I use for my wife or my kids. Just because I use that word doesn't mean that that word has the meaning that I'm expressing or that it in, intends to express. In a relationship with God, when I say that I love God with all of my heart, that's the key because everything else flows from that. So when I have a great relationship with the Lord, when I'm actually born again, when the Spirit of God resides within me and I actually love Him, I can love you. I can love you the way I'm supposed to. But if I only say that I love God, but in reality I don't. I mean, I never read the Word of God. What does that matter? I never pray unless I need something. I never go to church unless I'm trying to pretend that I go to church so that the girl or the guy I'm with at church that night thinks I'm a Christian, but I really don't go to church. I don't have any real Christian friends. And I've never talked about the Lord to anybody. I don't really care to do that. That's not really something that I am, you know, have an Im impulse to do. I mean, all of those things are, are indicators that I don't really have a relationship with God. Because if I have a relationship with the Lord, I can't help but speak about Him. You know, I have people sometimes, as a matter of fact, often, uh, people I don't know when I do outside things, they'll walk up to me, and they'll say things to me like, how's Marie? And I've been in other states, I mean, a lot of other states where, you know, they'll walk up and say, how's Marie? And how are the kids? And, and these people don't know my wife, and they don't know my kids. 
So I'll smile at them. Originally, I'd look at them, and I'd say, how do you know Marie? Did you go out with her? I mean, is there a secret you want to... Now, how do you know Marie, you know? How do you know her? They say, they, they'll say, I listened to you on the radio, and you mention her, and you mention your kids, and they'll name my kids to me, Corinne and David, and they talk about my grandkids now. How's, you know, I get letters from people, how's Sophie and how's Josiah doing? You know, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That, that's the way it works. People will know what you really believe in just by the way you are. They'll know what really matters to you just by what you talk about. It, it just comes out. It's just natural. And, and I didn't get it for the longest time. I thought, no. Well, and, and finally, the Lord said, you know, he said it like this nicely, you idiot. I mean, you're, you're always, you bring them up in your messages. And, and I honestly, it's not like I have in my notes talk about Marie. It just comes out. And so the natural thing, what's inside of you, you're going to be known for. So all day long, I can run around saying, oh, I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. What I am speaks so loudly, people can't hear a word that I'm saying. What I really believe is going to come out in, in, in the majority of my life, not the occasion. You know, because sometimes people go to church, you know, we, we have Easter services. We have to have four services because people come on Easter. We go back to three services because they're not going to be here next week. We know that. So we do our best to give them a message and hope that they hear it and they get right with God. That's, that's what Easter services are all about for us, is to celebrate the risen Lord. But we, we've been at it long enough to know that people show up on one day and don't come the next. We know that. That's not news to us. That's not new to us. It's, it's reality. That's what happens. But, but well, I've met people who say, I go to your church. I've been there 12 years, and I've never seen them in my life. I've never seen them in my life. And you know what? You, you may or may not believe this, but as I scan the congregation, I get to recognizing faces. I may not know names, but I will recognize you from a distance. This is true. I was in a restaurant one time, and somebody who's in our church, still in our church, been in our church well over 20-some years now, walked up to me in the restaurant and introduced themselves to me years ago. And they said, we go to your fellowship. And I said, oh, yeah, how, yeah, how nice. And talked for a moment, and they, they walked about 20 feet away and turned around for a second. I said, oh, now I recognize you, you know, because <laughs> there's a distance between us, you know. Oh, yeah, how are you doing? You know, that kind of thing, you know. But then again, you know, sometimes people say they come to this fellowship, and then they maybe occasionally will show up maybe once or twice a year, but they claim this is their church. Not to say that that qualifies them to be or not to be a Christian. It's just that we say some things, but we don't act on those things sometimes. Loving God. When you love God with all of your heart, you're going to treat other people right. There seems to be a connection between having false gods and sexual sins. Interesting. Interesting. Paul points it out in Romans chapter 1. Paul points it out in Colossians chapter 3. The writers of 1st and 2nd Kings point it out. And the fact is, the lack of love for God is going to be ma manifested by a lack of affection for others. And it's interesting how it ties together. If you take notes, Leviticus 18, verses 20 through 22. Listen to this. God in Leviticus, in the Old Testament book of Leviticus, is giving commands. He says in Leviticus 18, verses 20 through 22, you shall not lie carnally with your neighbor's wife to defile yourself with her. You shall not let any of your descendants pass through the fire to Molech, nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not lie with a man as with a woman. It is an abomination sexual sin, but I want you to notice something. He said, you shall not let any of your descendants pass through the fire to Molech. Now, wait a minute. You first have said that I'm not to have sexual relationships with my neighbor's wife. You have also said that I'm not to live in a homosexual relationship with, with a same-sex partner. But why do you sandwich between those two commands of sexual sins that I'm not supposed to give my children to Molech? How does that work? 
Who is Molech? We're going to see this. Who is Molech? Molech was a false god, and what happened during the worship of Molech is children would be placed on the arms of a metal image, a metal image with a bull's head that was placed on a man's body. And the arms were on an incline. And the mothers would bring their children and they would place the babies on the arms of this, this brass or this metal god, image of a god, an idol. Now, in the chest area, the belly area, there was a hole and inside was a fire that was burning. And the mothers would place their children in the arms of Molech, and they would roll down the image's red-hot arms as they were being seared, and they would fall into a pit of fire to be consumed as a living sacrifice to Molech. The idolatry extended to the killing of your own children, to the destruction of your own babies. Molech was an evil god that they would actually give their children to as an offering. A god represents pleasure. Do people still sacrifice children to a god of pleasure? Do they? Do they? We don't have m images of metal with bellies that are filled with fire. This may sound hard, forgive me if it does, but we still sacrifice our children to the god of pleasure. We just call it abortion, but we still do. We still do. I can't tell you how many Christians think that abortion's okay. I can't tell you. One survey said 70% of people going to church think abortion's okay. It's the result of sexual impurity, a loving of the world more than God, and it's a similar mentality of saying, this is something that I can do with no consequence. And God said, I hate it. Because when you don't love me, you're not going to properly love one another. And when you don't properly love one another, then sex is going to become something more important than it ought to be in your relationship. Because marriage is holy before God, and the marriage bed is undefiled, the writer of Hebrews says. God created man in his image and intended man and woman to have a relationship that in him was pleasurable. He gave a command. It's the only command that man has never resisted. Be fruitful and multiply. And we have. Because as God created all things, when he created man and he created that relationship, he said, it is good. And indeed, in the Lord, it is. It's intended to be pleasurable. But when it is taken outside of the covenant relationship with God and it becomes something recreational, it's a form of idolatry, and it is something that God judges. And that's what's taking place here. They were guilty of that kind of worship, and God brings judgment. God is saying, I'm going to bring judgment on you through the nation of Babylon. He's already brought Babylon against uh, the nation of Israel on two occasions, but the third judgment is what's in the future that he's speaking about, that takes place in 588 to 586 B.C. In 2 Kings, in chapter 25, verses 1 and 2, it says, It came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and encamped against it. They built a siege wall against it all around, so the city was besieged until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. So that does take place, and that's still in the future, and that's what he's referring to. Now, when this happens, the majority of the nation is judged. You see, the people refused to tear down their high places. So God made sure that those high places were torn down. It's interesting that when God was working in a man's life, a man by the name of Solomon, 
When God was working in the life of Solomon during his reign, God had told him that if he's going to be blessed by God, that Solomon was to worship God and worship him alone. And so what he did is he, he received permission to build God a temple. Remember that Solomon is the son of David, and King David desired to build a temple for his God. But God said, David, you have been a man of war, and, and it's a good thing that you have it in your heart to build me a temple. But because your hands are full of blood, I'm not going to allow you to do that. But what we will do is we will allow your son to build me a temple. So what David did is he provided finances and he provided plans, but his son Solomon was given the task of building the temple. So Solomon built that temple for God, and it took him seven years and a multitude of craftsmen of constant work until they finally had constructed this temple. And then Solomon gives a prayer of dedication to the Lord as the, as the temple has been established. And then God responds to his prayer. It's found in, in 1 Kings chapter 9, verses 6 through 9, where he says, If you or your sons at all turn from following me and do not keep my commandments and my statutes, which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, I will cut off Israel from the land which I have given them. And this house which I have consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight. Israel be, will be a proverb and a byword among all the peoples. And as for this house which is exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and will hiss and say, why has the Lord done thus to this land and to this house? And then they will answer, because they forsook the Lord their God who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt and have embraced other gods and worshiped them and served them. Therefore the Lord has brought all this calamity on them. God said, listen, if you remain faithful to me as your, as your father um, David was, I will bless you. But if you turn from me, then I will deal with you. Well, we know the story. We know what happened with Solomon. Solomon later on had 1,000 women in his life, 700 wives and 300 concubines. And the Bible tells us that his wives turned his heart from the Lord, and he didn't pursue God the way that his father did. In 1 Kings 11, 7, it says, Solomon built high places for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, on the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon. And so God made a statement in chapter 11, verse 11. He said, I'm going to tear the kingdom out of your hand and give it to one of your servants. And what happens is one of the servants of, of, of Solomon, a man by the name of Jeroboam, actually was used to divide the, the nation of Israel into two sections, into the ten northern tribes and leaving the two southern tribes. Rehoboam, Solomon's son, ruled over the south, but Jeroboam ruled over the north. And what happened with Jeroboam is in order to keep the people of Israel from going from the, the north to the south to worship in, in Jerusalem, he actually established two golden calves, one in the north in a place called Dan, a second in the south in a place called Bethel to keep the ten northern tribes from going south to, to Jerusalem to worship God, and he created a false religious system. And he introduced and reintroduced the worship and the idolatry, and ultimately what happened is he was judged for it. Three centuries passed. The nation continued in idolatry. And then God ultimately brings judgment on the nation through Assyria and then through Babylon. In 2 Kings 25, 9 through 12, it speaks of how the captain of the guard for um, Nebuchadnezzar burned the house of the Lord and the king's house. All the houses of Jerusalem, that is, all the houses of the great, he burned with fire. All the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard broke down the walls of Jerusalem all around. Then Nebuzaradan, the, the captain of the guard, carried away captive the rest of the people who remained in the city and the defectors who had deserted to the king of Babylon with the rest of the multitude. But the captain of the guard left some of the poor of the land as vine dressers and farmers. And so that's what he's speaking about here in Ezekiel chapter 6 when he says in verse 8, I will leave a remnant so that you may have some who escape the sword among the nations when you are scattered through the countries. Then those of you who escape will remember me among the nations where they are carried captive because I was crushed by their adulterous heart which had departed from me and by their eyes which play the harlot after their idols. They will loathe themselves for the evils which they committed in all their abominations and they shall know that I am the Lord. I have not said in vain that I will bring this calamity upon them. I'll leave a remnant. God's grace and mercy is always extended to a remnant, a godly remnant. God didn't bring a complete end to the nation of Israel. 
We're told in 2 Kings 25, 12, the captain of the guard left some of the poor of the land as vine dressers and farmers. God left a remnant. In Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 through 26, it says, Though, uh, through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. I believe that there are parallels. I believe that people are, because I, I get emails after these studies and, and questions are asked, and this is one of the questions. Pastor, do you think that, that there are parallels between the nation of Israel and the United States? I think there are always parallels in Scripture. You can see how God works and you can learn how he worked in that time and you can see in the New Testament that he continues to work in similar ways. It's been said. Billy Graham is one who said this. If God doesn't judge the United States, he'll apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. And I think that the United States is ripe for judgment. Absolutely. There's no doubt about that. We have so many people who claim to be Christians. Now, you know, I'll be honest with you. I'm going to speak from my heart for just a moment here. I, I as a pastor and as a, as a, as a man and an older man now, I, you know, if I were to see myself at certain stages of my Christian life, I would definitely wonder whether I got it or not, to be honest with you. There were periods in my life when if you saw me, you know, it wouldn't be evidential that I knew the Lord. You know, there were times in my life that I, I just was kind of just floating. I was going with the tide. I wasn't growing and, and things like that. And so I, I have a, 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 a tendency towards having a, um, an understanding heart towards people who are struggling. I, I, I've been there. I've done that. And I, I can, on occasion, I still struggle. I still have to say, Lord, you got to help me. And so I don't speak as one who's judging, though it, it can seem sometimes that I do. I, I hasten to say that, that no, I, I don't. I, I probably have a lot more understanding in that area than... Than, than I might give an impression of having. With that said, sometimes I, I have great concern for those who refer to themselves as believers because I just don't see fruit in their life. And, and it's not just, um, you know, for a short season where perhaps they're a little dry and the Lord is doing a work of breaking and he's going to have to break up that fallow ground so he can do some new work in them. Sometimes it's for years. They're just not changing. I mean, and, and it concerns me. Even in this fellowship, that, that I, I do the best that I can as a pastor, and we who hold the word and lead in worship and serve here, we do the best that we can to honor the Lord in all that we do. Even in our fellowship, I know that there are, there are, there are people that, that show up but, but aren't even interested in, 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 in the Bible studies. They're not concerned about their walks with the Lord. I mean, I get, you know, I get the, the people who come up to me and say, you know, during the Bible study, it's real hard for me to listen because people are just talking. Or during the Bible study, I'm really distracted because the person next to me is texting through the whole thing and not even listening to a word that's being said. I mean, I know that takes place here. I understand that. I realize that. I know that there are people who have to be here. They're being forced to be here, and they don't necessarily want to be here. I understand that. But it still grieves me. It grieves me for their sake. It grieves me because there are a lot of things that, that, that they're going to go through that they just don't have to go through until they learn. I've spoken to my kids and I've said, listen, I've done everything I can to, to raise you in such a way that you don't have a testimony like mine. You know, I don't want you to have my testimony. I want you to have a better a life than I had. I want you to have a relationship with God when, from an early uh, uh, age all the way until old age. You don't need to go out and learn the lessons I've learned. You, you just listen to somebody who's been there and, and, and you can be turned away from those things. But you know what? There's a lot of people who say, I have to forge my own path. I have to have my own testimony. I'm willing to go through these things. And they suffer terribly. I can't tell you how many people I see who suffer on the one hand, they're saying, oh, I love the Lord, but on the other hand, everything they do would, would speak against any real love or knowledge of God at all. It's because they, they're not even lukewarm. They're just people who claim to, to know the Lord. So I get concerned. I get concerned because I have no illusions whatsoever that every person who's seated here right now or who's seated in our church services ever 
I have no belief that every single person there is walking solidly with the Lord. I know, I know otherwise because I stand down here afterwards and I minister to quite a number of people on Sunday mornings. And I get the emails and the questions and, and all of that. I guess the question is, is, do we have to go through those things? Is it necessary? God spoke to the nation of Israel. He said, thou shalt not have false gods. And God said, I'm warning you. I'm going to deal with you. Tear down all of their idols. Tear down all of those places that they offer incense. Don't have anything to, to do with Molech and, and, and Chemosh and all the rest of those idols. These are evil. Have nothing to do with them. And yet, the children of Israel... We're just constantly rebelling against God's word. And of all people on the face of the earth, they were most responsible because they had most given to them. Is, is, is that something that we can see in the church today? Absolutely. God has given to us his word. God has told us what we should and should not do. God has given us not only his word, he's given us his power that we can overcome if we yield to him. And so I believe that, that people even to this day have the same mentality. You see, there will always be a godly remnant. And, and here he said in verse 8, I have, I will leave a remnant. There is always going to be genuine believers amongst those who claim to be. He says, no, these people are the godly ones, and these are the ones that, that are keeping the nation from being destroyed right now. He says in verse 9 and 10, he said, Then those of you who escape will remember me among the nations where they, carried, they are carried captive, because I was crushed by their adulterous heart, which has departed from me, by their eyes, which play the harlot after their idols. They'll loathe themselves for the evils which they've committed in all their abominations. And so God intends this judgment that he's bringing against the nation to break them, that they might repent God looks for us to have a humble heart, and he intends for them to be broken through this. It reminds me of that story in Luke 18 where the two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. The tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So God wants us to, to know that, listen, if you have sinned, it, it ought to cause you grief. And if you have that grief, then you can repent, and you can return to me. I want you to understand that. You see, God is going to bring judgment on the nation of Israel. And according to verse 10, that's going to cause them to recognize that God is true to his word. Verse 11, thus says the Lord God, pound your fists and stamp your feet and say, alas, for all the evil abominations of the house of Israel, for they shall fall by the sword, by famine, by pestilence. He who is far off shall die by the pestilence. He who is near shall fall by the sword. And, and he who remains and is besieged shall die by famine. Thus I'll spend my fury upon them, and then you shall know that I am the Lord. When their slain are among their idols all around their, their altars, on every high hill, on all mountaintops, under every green tree, and under every thick oak, wherever they offered sweet incense to all their idols, so I will stretch out my hand against them and make the land desolate, yes, more desolate than the wilderness towards Debla in all their dwelling places. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. Three times he says that. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. He's saying, I want you to have expressions of dismay because I want you to realize how terrible things are soon to be. You're going to suffer, he's telling these people. You're going to suffer the sword. You're going to suffer famine and pestilence. It's going to engulf the whole land, and it doesn't matter how far or how near to Jerusalem you are. The result is going to be that you're going to know that I'm the Lord. You see, when the judgment falls, they're going to recognize that God alone is worthy of worship, and every place that they've committed idolatry will be under his judgment. It's going to cover the entire land from the north to the south. That's what he means when he says the wilderness to Dibla. And the result when God brings this chastening and judgment on the nation, is you are going to know that there's only one God and that he is the supreme God. 
you shall know, he says, that I am the Lord. God brings judgment so that they come to recognize that he is the sovereign God over the universe, and it's going to take place. Now, finally, Ezekiel, I'm certain Ezekiel did not like giving that kind of message. I'm certain he didn't. Uh, I'm pretty sure he wouldn't be invited on any Christian programs today, you know. Ezekiel, would you like to come and give a word? And then he'd say that. Can you imagine what would happen if he did that on some of the Christian stations today? He'd be banned. They'd say, no, you need to say good things. You need to say smooth things. You need to say things that tickle our ears. You need to say things that are going to cause churches to be filled. I mean, Ezekiel, Ezekiel didn't have a profitable ministry. There weren't, there weren't people that really did come to Christ through his ministry or come to God through his ministry. You know, but he had a, a very difficult message that he had to give. He had to give a message because God said, this is my message. You're, su you're supposed to say, the word of the Lord came to me. You're supposed to say, thus saith the Lord. Finally, when you go through the Bible, you find God's grace and you see God's holiness. You see God's mercy and you see God's judgment. And what we do is we try to bring a balance to that. And me, as a believer, I like to say, Lord, I'm thankful that, that you worked graciously and mercifully in my life, but I pray for those and all of us together that we might together understand how holy you really are so that my life might be transformed and that our lives might come into a, accordance with your word so that we might actually understand that much of what we see here in, in the time of Ezekiel is pretty much repeated in, in, in the lives that we live amongst the people that we know in the nation that we dwell in. And so, Lord, you know, help me to, to be one of the godly ones in the midst of those who don't know you. Help me to live a life that pleases you even when it seems to be going against what other people hold fast to. Help me to be willing to say, but this is what God's Word says on this issue rather than yielding to it or, or apologizing for believing that or once stating that. Help me hold fast to the things that, that you say because I want to be consistent with you and not popular opinion. And when you have that kind of heart, God will use you. As a hippie, for me, I didn't have a spine. It didn't really matter. I, I was one of these guys who'd say, just go with the flow. It doesn't really matter. I was one of these guys who'd say, just be mellow. It doesn't really matter. I mean, you have that opinion. You have your opinion. You hold fast to it. That's fine. But for me, I don't have that. And when I got saved, I can still remember doing this. I was in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, 1971. And I was walking in the woods right outside of where my barracks were. And I remember walking towards this track that I would run. And I remember praying, God, give me a spine. Give me a spine. I don't have one. Give me strength to hold fast to what is true. And give me a heart to know what the truth is. And I can remember, I'm almost repeating the prayer because it's something I've said over the years. Because, Father, it is easy to waffle. It is easy to just play both sides. Give me a strength so that I will say, this I know for sure, and on this I will stand for sure. Help me to be that kind of person because I don't like being weak and I don't want to waffle. I want to believe completely and surely. And I, re I remember praying that. God, help me to have a spine. Help me to be strong. And over the years, I've developed one. Over the years, I've read enough of the Word and taught enough of the Word to say, Thus saith the Lord. God is true. Let God be true and every man a liar. God's Word is true. And we need to hold fast to it. And we need to live by it. Because if we do, God will bless us. If we don't, our lives are not going to be worth much. Because salt that's lost its flavor is good for nothing, Jesus said, except to be tossed out and walked upon by men. So, Lord, I want to be used by you. 
So see, when I read the Old Testament, I know that we're under the covenant of grace, and I know that Jesus Christ works in our life, and I know that he brings mercy and compassion, and he fills it with his Holy Spirit, and he's forgiven us of all of our sins. But I say, God, help me to see your ways. Why were you so angry? And the answer is, is because these people who were called by my name were idolaters, sacrificed their own children for the God of pleasure, and I brought judgment on them. Will God deal with his children? Well, God says that he brings chastening to his children. The writer of Hebrews says if God doesn't chasten you, you're not his child. So he does bring chastening to us. So see, I'm one of these kids that I, I, I my dad didn't have to spank me because I wanted to learn the first time. So I didn't have to go through that lesson a second. And it's kind of funny, I brought that into my Christian life. And the Lord teaches me the first time, I don't want to learn it a second. I want to learn it the first time. Because God is so good, he'll repeat the lesson until I learn it. He's good. And he does. And I have to tell you, I try to learn the first lessons. The first spanking, the first chastening, that's enough for me, Lord. Okay, I know you're not pleased with this, I won't do this again. May we all have an understanding of how good God is but let's understand he's a holy God.